very fortunate today to have um, our speaker, Bill Muirhead, Dr. Professor Bill Muirhead, uh, here from Boston University. Um, Bill was an undergraduate, you just told me this, this is a test for me. <laughs> he was an undergraduate at Michigan, thank you. Uh, I, heard, I knew previously that he went from there to be a graduate student at Cornell, and then was a postdoc at Caltech for a couple of years before joining the faculty and being a Hubble Fellow at Boston University. Uh, and I know him very well because we work on very similar fields, as you'll see. Um, we also, I think he's not going to talk about it today, but we can talk to you guys about it offline in his integration work, um, and also his work on MDORS. And also, we served on the NOA attack together a few years ago. So, so welcome. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jen. Uh, so my name is Bill. I'm a junior faculty at, at, at BU, Boston University. Um, and if you're curious, yes, I am upset. Uh, Belichick should have started Malcolm Butler. He's a top 10 corner, but told him for some guy who's never played. Can't believe it. I'm furious. <laughs> so I'm going to channel all that anger into this talk. <laughs> Um, there are Cubs fans in the audience, so oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> other cities might, you know, win. I, so I actually, I grew up in Houston, uh, so that's that's not an easy sports town to come from uh, until recently. Um, so I can appreciate being from a difficult sports market. Uh, but now I live in one where it's, you expect a championship every season. Uh, so anyway, I'm here to present some work from my group. The title of my talk is Small Stars with Small Planets and Big Consequences. So I'm going to be talking about uh, small main sequence stars, specifically M dwarf stars. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the planets that orbit them, and um, a little bit about the consequences of discovering these planets. Uh, and I have a, a relatively large group uh, at BU. Some of these people have gone off to other things, but uh, Julie Skinner is a, a current postdoc. <coughs> Brett Cole worked with me. He's gone off to industry. And a bunch of grad students and some undergrads uh, who also taken off. Brian Healy is now a Grad student at Johns Hopkins, um, and uh, yeah, so five grad students, and they've all contributed in various ways to the research I'm going to present. So I'll start with um, uh, a tweet uh, from uh, Coral Wheeler, who at the time was a PhD student at UC Irvine. She's now a postdoc somewhere. I don't remember where, but she works in a different field than mine. And she was at this conference, LGA stack. So LGA is local group. Anybody here study galaxies, they know immediately what LGA stat is. I didn't attend this. But also attending this was um, uh, David Hope, who's a professor at NYU. And at this conference, he stated this, and, and uh, Coral Wheeler tweeted it. I work on cosmology and exoplanets, and both communities are pissed that we don't yet understand stars. Um, now, generally, uh, I would not recommend junior people quote senior researchers verbatim when they speak because they can say things they don't necessarily want communicated. But I like this tweet, and I'm glad she tweeted it because this also captures the work that I'm doing. Uh, in the case of transiting exoplanets, um, this is basically astronomy 101, but if you have, if you are lucky enough to have a planet transiting across the uh, face of another star, you see a dip in the brightness of the star due to that planet blocking light from the, from the star. And the depth of that decrease in brightness uh, equals the geometric area, projected geometric area of the planet divided by the projected geometric area of the star projected onto the, onto the, uh, onto the sky. And if you divide your pi's out, the depth equals the radius of the planet divided by the radius of the star squared. This is AS101. Um, now, uh, this is what you're measuring, is this delta right here. You're measuring this. This is your measured quantity, which is maybe in percent, 1% for uh, Jupiter, uh, a few hundred parts per million for an Earth-sized planet, so very small transit depth for a, a small planet. But you get this delta, but what you're interested in, the interesting physics, the astrophysics, is in the radius of the star, because I want to know, is it terrestrial? Is it one Earth radius? Or is it uh, more like a Neptune-sized star, a uh, larger than two Earth radii, uh, four Earth radii, or is it a hot Jupiter or a Jupiter uh, with a radius of uh, 11 Earth radii? So the astrophysics is here, your measurement is here, and you can see for a transit observation 
you have to know the rays of a star to get at that astrophysics, right? If you know this, if you're interested in this, you have to estimate the radius of the star. Uh, so your inferred planet radius is proportional to your estimated radius of the star. And I'm using very specific terms here, inferred and estimated, because you're not actually measuring either of these quantities. You're not actually measuring. You're not taking a ruler up to the star and measuring the size, right? And you're not taking a ruler up to the planet to measure the size. You're, in, you're inferring the rays of the planet based on your estimate, whatever, from whatever information you have, uh, based on your estimate for the size of the star. Now, this very simple equation leads to what op people often call the small star advantage. And this is an image I stole from the Planet Hunters website, which is where citizen scientists can go search for transiting planets among or within uh, public data from the Kepler spacecraft or the K2 mission. Uh, so the small star advantage is the idea that if you take the same planet, in this case something about the size of Jupiter, and it, uh, you imagine that planet transiting a sun-like star, a G2-type uh, star, versus a smaller star, an M-dwarf star in this case, which is about half the radius. The same planet size produces a much deeper transit if the star is small. Okay, so this is why we often try to search for planets orbiting M-dwarfs. Um, some people are genuinely interested in why you might have planets orbiting M-dwarfs. Other people just want to find the smallest planets they can. <laughs> they want to find Earth-like planets, or Mercury-like planets, or Mars-sized planets. And we've actually found all, all, all those various sizes, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, so often people will go target these stars because the signal is so much larger. So this is what, when people talk about the small star advantage, we're talking about this. A bigger signal for the same size planet. And uh, you can see this, actually, if you look at the data, if you look at all the different exoplanets that have been found. Uh, so if you go to a website like exoplanets.org, you can make various plots plotting various different things. And for this talk, um, yesterday, I went on the website and made a plot uh, showing the radius of stars versus the radii, the radii of stars versus the radii of their uh, planets that they host. These are all real planets that have been found. And you can see uh, some interesting patterns in this plot. First of all, you see two clumps. You see this clump up here of planets that are about one Jupiter radius in size orbiting uh, sun-like stars. This is solar radius. So one is the sun, and one here is Jupiter. Uh, these planets are largely found by ground-based transit surveys, like HAT, HATnet, or WASP. Um, and you already see a trend here. You see that for smaller stars, so this direction is a smaller star, those programs are finding smaller planets. Now, they're not that small. These are still near one Jupiter radius, so these are still gas giants, but you already you see a trend here for those ground-based surveys. And then you see the other clump here, this massive clump of planets, and nearly all of those were found by the Kepler spacecraft. So the Kepler spacecraft was a NASA mission designed with very high photometric precision to enable the detection of very shallow transits from small planets. And again, you can see these trends here. You see these interesting lines. These are actually a complete, uh, this is actually due to rounding by the Kepler team. These are not real. There are actual tracks of planets. <laughs> this is not astrophysical. That's purely rounding. But the point is, you do see some trends that you can find smaller planets around smaller stars. And a few of these uh, are actually quite special. Um, so if we go over here, some of uh, these objects over here, these, these three planets here, are actually the first three planets found around the TRAPPIST-1 system. So this got a lot of press a couple of years ago. Uh, since then, they found another four planets orbiting the system. So this it didn't make it into exoplanets.org, but there are actually seven planets orbiting this very small star, 0.12 solar radii. Um, and then over here are some objects that I've worked on. So here we have Kepler-42, Kepler-445, and Kepler-446. So these are objects from Kepler. Uh, that, that my team's been working on, and we actually published these particular sizes and radii. And then you have this other little one right here. This is actually an error in the catalog. So this is actually orbiting a sun-like star. So is, I looked that one up yesterday, and I was like, what? There's a new tiny planet around a small star? No, it's just a mistake in there in the catalog. So that's a small star advantage. You can find small planets around small stars because the transits are really deep. Just, just geometry. There's no calculus. No Cauchy integrals, just geometry. 
Uh, but now, and what I want to spend most of the talk on, is not the small star advantage, but the small star disadvantage. And this is a, a term that I'm using, but not used in the community. It's term I'm using. And it's illustrated by the wide ranges of sizes that M-type stars can have. So here again, I've taken the sun, I've made a circle in PowerPoint, and I put a little glow around it to give you a chromosphere, you can do that in PowerPoint. I made it yellow, the sun is actually not yellow. The sun is white. The only reason, the only reason that gives a little yellow tint is because of the Earth's atmosphere. So if you look at the sun as an astronaut, it's white, but I just did this so you don't recognize it. Uh, so here's the sun with a Jupiter-sized planet orbiting it, uh, giving you some 1% transit dip. And I've also made little PowerPoint circles indicating M dwarfs across the M type sequence. So these are all stars with very similar spectra. They're not the same spectra. So this is spectral type. These are different spectral types. So here we have you know, G2 for the sun, M1, M4, and M8 across the M type sequence. They're not the same spectra because they wouldn't be given numbers after them. They're slightly different, but they're very similar spectra. They have the same features in their spectra. Titanium oxide, H2O, calcium hydride, standard features that you find in envelopes. But you see a pretty big difference in the sizes of these stars across the M-type sequence. It's actually a factor of six. So this is about 0.1 solar radii. This is about 0.6 solar radii. So a factor of six. Notice the temperatures. This is 3,800 Kelvin. This is 2,800 Kelvin. So across 1,000 degrees Kelvin for the, the, the photospheric temperature, that's the effective temperature, it's obviously not the temperature deep inside the star, just on the surface. Across 1,000 degrees, you have a pretty big change in radius. And also, I've scaled these little planets here that I've drawn, all to give you the same transit depth. Okay, so these are all about a 1% transit uh, depth. And that's the difference. This is a factor of six in stellar radius. All right? If they all have the same transit depth, that's a factor of six in your inferred planet radius, because that's what we want it. We want to find the Earth-like planets. So what it means is the difference in the inferred planets is a factor of six. That's the difference between an Earth-sized planet and a gas giant. It's a difference between something that you could walk around on and something that is a ball of gas. And if that planet happens to be in the habitable zone, that's a pretty big deal, right? Because we think habitability requires a surface for liquid water to pool talk to our biologist friends about that. But, I mean, if you put Jupiter in Earth's orbit around the sun, um, would you imagine that it could be habitable? Maybe, but not with life as we know it. We need something to stand on. We need pools of water for life to start in. Uh, so that's, that's, that's important. It's the difference between rocky and gaseous. Now, this dramatic change in radius of the star versus only a few hundred Kelvin is captured nicely by measurements. So here, uh, and this is a plot, and I'm going to show a lot of plots like this. It's effectively a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with slightly different quantities on it. So think your Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, temperature and luminosity. It's up here, uh, I replaced, or well, I, I did make this plot, but the paper was led by Tabitha Biagin. Um, uh, I'm a co-author on this. Uh, I've replaced luminosity with radius of the star. Okay, so it's a little bit different than an HR diagram, but you still have temperature going the wrong way, so all the astronomers are happy. These are measured radii of stars using optical long baseline interferometry, where you take telescopes and you spread them out across the mountain, you take the light and interfere it, and you mimic a much, much larger telescope with an angular resolution that's smaller, than, that's less than a milli arc second. So when we talk about inferring stellar radii, estimating stellar radii, these are measured stellar radii, measured with a ruler, where the ruler is the char interferometer on Mount Wilson. All right? And you can plot that measured radius of a star versus its temperature. And the M dwarfs are, guess where? Right where this plot gets very steep, right, right where these data points get extremely steep. Now, unfortunately, I covered this up. There's a legend here, which I covered because I wanted to show you the optical interferometer. Uh, these are models. So these are models of stars in a computer. You put the equations for stellar structure in there, you put in some opacities, you put in some convection, and you run a model. So you can kind of ignore those. These points here are actual measurements. And you see this is incredibly steep. 
What that means is when you go look at an MDOR, I found a planet around an MDOR. Okay, exciting. I want to estimate its radius. The parameter that is the easiest thing to measure for a star, the temperature. Right? You can take a spectrum and measure that temperature. If I measure the temperature that's right about here, uh, 31, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3,500 Kelvin, I have nearly a factor of 2 in radius in terms of measured stars. These are all stars with, this, with the same temperature, but factor of 2 in radius. So temperature is not enough. So that's the difference between a 1 Earth radius planet and a 2 Earth radius planet. And we think 2 Earth radius planets are, are actually atmosphere dominated, not rocky. So you're in a difficult situation there. Uh, so this is just pointing out you have a large change in radius and temperature for these M-type stars. Now these are measured with a, an interferometer. You can also measure radii of stars. How? Does anybody think of the, easy, the, the sort of classic way to measure radii of stars? Exactly. Exactly. It goes back to, I think, Henry uh, Russell might have been one of the first first astronomers to do that. You can use eclipsing binary stars. So if you have an eclipsing binary star, they're blocking, the stars are orbiting each other, they are eclipsing each other. You can determine their radii from, uh, you need both radial velocities and the eclipses. And my group has an eclipsing binary program and we keep track of all the eclipsing binaries in the literature. So if there's ever a published paper, we add it to a little Google Doc. And so a couple days ago, I, I went back and checked it and downloaded all the data and made this plot for you. These are literature observations. I couldn't possibly cite all of them on the slide, but there are you know, uh, dozens and dozens of papers involved in this. But you see the same thing. You see down here in the M-dwarfs, these small, cool stars, a dramatic change in radius for the same temperature. There's a whole bunch of scatter here. In fact, there's much more scatter here than there is in the case of the interferometric radii. So that's really interesting. So temperature is not very good at giving you the radius of the star. Um, I will say that M dwarfs are, uh, I, I wrote here, a bit better behaved with regard to mass. They're, they're actually much better behaved with regard to their mass. Um, so another couple of parameters we can measure for M dwarf stars, uh, if we have a binary, a visual binary, where the stars are orbiting each other, and you can see them orbit each other on the sky. This is a plot from some recent work, uh, Benedict et al., who's at uh, UC Austin. Uh, where he acquired visual binary observations for uh, dozens and dozens of M dwarf stars, you can determine their dynamical mass. So what, what mass must they have to give you those orbits? Um, and then you can also measure their individual luminosities if you have a distance to them. So if you have a distance to the stars, you can get their luminosities, you get their absolute magnitudes. And here we have a very nice relationship between the mass of the star, the mass of the M dwarf, and the absolute K band magnitude. These are called mass luminosity relations. This is not technically a luminosity. It's not a volumetric luminosity. It's just the absolute K-band infrared magnitude. But you've got this nice, nice, uh, very well-behaved uh, or curve. All in one. And so if you have an absolute magnitude for the star, you can get its mass really, really well. Now, that's not what we're after here. We're after the radius, because we want the plant. We want to know, is this terrestrial? Could we go stomp on it? Um, so maybe we can get the mass if we have this absolute cave and magnitude. Well, uh, Tabitha Biagin in the same paper um, looked at the mass radius relationship for the stars that have interferometric radii. Again, measured with char. So here's the mass inferred from m sub k versus the radius, and you have sort of a nice line here. You've got a point here that's a little weird, but uh, this says you can take m sub k, absolute k band magnitude, get a mass, plug it into a mass radius relationship, and you're done. Right? You're, you're good. You now have the radius of the star. You now know, the, know whether you can go stop on that planet or whether you have to fly around in it with the plane because it's a purely gaseous plane. Uh, that's not the end of the story because, again, we can consider not just the interferometric radius measurement. We can also look at eclipsing binaries, and this is where things get really, really hairy. So I took this Google Doc I have with all these masses and radii for M dwarf stars and made this plot. This is 
uh, again, radius, same plot as before as, as from the interferometric plot I just showed you. Radius of the star versus mass. I've, I know this is sort of a weird way to do it, but I'm trying to keep it like an HR diagram, so I flipped mass around. So this is still like an HR diagram, right? Small stars are down here. And uh, you notice a few interesting features on this. These are all the literature eclipsing binary stars. Uh, you see there appears to be some line here, which is well behaved, similar to the results from interferometry. But then you also have these really weird data points up here. These are eclipsing binary stars. These are stars that are eclipsing. You have the dips. You have the velocity measurements. So presumably this isn't uh, some mistake in the analysis, but I'll show you in a minute. We, we think it actually is for several of these. Uh, so what's going on with these stars, which are not well behaved? And how do I know when I find that awesome planet transit? How do I know it's you know, a well-behaved M, M dwarf with a mass and radius that's consistent, or one of these weirdos up here that's really big? And here you're talking about a huge, I mean, this is a factor of three. So your planet goes from terrestrial again to gaseous. So what's going on with those? And there have been some interesting hypotheses involving magnetic fields actually inflating those stars, very strong magnetic fields inside the stars, inhibiting convection, changing effectively the stellar structure equations, and then popping them up. Um, I actually don't think that's what's, going, that's what's going on here, and that's what I'll talk about. So that was a lot of astronomy jargon. I hope any of you who are from the physics department, maybe for, on the physics side of the department, aren't, aren't asleep. <laughs> but let's unpack this just a little bit. So, Effective temperature alone is a poor predictor for the radius of an envelope because of that big change, that very steep radius temperature curve. Um, luminosity is a good predictor of mass. Nice, good, okay, that's good. Mass is generally a good predictor of radius, except for these handful of eclipsing binaries that, that appear to be much larger than they should be. So what's going on? Um, there are a few theories here. So one is uh, magnetic fields, and this has been proposed by some, some theorists, including uh, Gilles Chabrier at the University of Exeter. Uh, Nolan McDonald is a team working on this for a long time at the University of Delaware. And uh, Matt Browning, also at Exeter, has done some simulations on this. And like I said, this is the idea that you're, you have very strong magnetic fields, mega gauss magnetic fields, deep inside the star, and they inhibit convection. They inhibit heat flow. So, these end stars, the vast majority of their energy transport is via convection. So hot cells rising up, reaching the surface, cooling, or reaching some length and cooling, and then dispelling their, their energy. If you have strong magnetic fields, that motion is inhibited effectively by the Lorentz law, but there are better ways, you know, advection, there are other smarter ways of thinking about it than just the Lorentz law. Uh, and so that's, that's one possibility. If you restrict energy transport, you're going to change the radius temperature mass relationship, and Chabrier and Mullen McDonald proposed that that's what's happening. Um, what else could be going on? Well, I haven't discussed metallicity at all, and I'm going to soon, because <laughs> metallicity, we believe, is the reason for the spread in radius versus temperature, and models actually show that as well. And then the last thing is actually the first thing I'm going to talk about, inaccurate radius measurements. Uh, and the truth is, it's probably all three of these. But magnetic fields, we do not think they're responsible for the hyperinflated stars, as I'll show you in a minute. They may be responsible for a little bit of inflation on the stars at the 5% level. Um, and I have a student who has a paper in review with some evidence supporting that, which I won't show here. Um, but it looks like they may have some, they have, made, they have some role, but not a huge role. Uh, again, metallicity, we think, is the reason for the spread. And this, this is something that we are actually really concerned about. So uh, let's go back to this plot. Radius of the star versus mass. All of our M dwarf stars are little stars. Um, we noticed when we started working on this project that one of these eclipsing binaries is a Kepler eclipsing binary. So this is a eclipsing binary with photometry from NASA's Kepler mission the greatest photometer ever built, the most precise photometer ever built. Maybe not the most accurate. Tech, tech cam is probably more accurate. But by, by far the most precise. And the data is public. Kepler data is public. And so we were like, well, 
this is bizarre. This star is really weird. In order to get this up here, the, the magnetic field would have to be absurdly strong in the star. Um, and the energy in the magnetic field would be larger than the energy in the heat of the star. I mean, it's just absurd the density, magnetic field density you need to make this, this fit. And so we went and took a look at it. Uh, since we have this Kepler data, we just download it, downloaded it. We used some fancy um, detrending routines that use Gaussian processes in order to remove variations from the spacecraft, from rotation of the stars. We have these primary and secondary eclipses, which are gorgeous, just beads on a string. Uh, if you ever play with ground-based eclipsing data, it doesn't look anywhere near this nice. And we can fit them with our own in-house eclipsing binary code, which is relatively straightforward. It has all the physics, it has a Romer delay. We don't do complicated spot structures. We just do spheres eclipsing each other. Straightforward. And we did that. Um, those original parameters that I showed you were published in a paper by Shakurlu. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a Turkish name, uh, Shakurlu et al. And then was followed up by a Spanish group, uh, Iglesias Marzoa, uh, actually last year. Both teams found that the stars were incredibly inflated. And then, so it didn't solve this problem. So we went and looked at it. We downloaded the cover data. We fit the eclipses. But what we did that was a little bit different is we acquired radio velocity measurements in the infrared, not at visible light. We used high resolution infrared spectroscopy to acquire the radio velocity measurements. We used the IGRINS spectrometer, which was built at, at UT on the Discovery Channel telescope. Um, we, we use a partner in that telescope. And we acquired a radio velocity curve that is slightly different than the published values. It doesn't look all that different. So our, our uh, RV curve is in the solid line, and the previous one is in the dashed line. And uh, this was led by a BU PhD student named Yun-Kyu Han. And you might think, how does that make a big difference, that little change in the radial velocity? Well, when you're fitting eclipsing binaries, the radial velocity is actually coupled to the photometer. It's a joint fit. Because nowhere in here is there a physical unit. The only, well there is, the only physical unit in this data is time on the x-axis. There's no meters in here. And you're measuring the radius of a star, you're going to measure that in meters. Your data has to have meters in there somewhere, right? That's just, something has to be measured in meters. And that thing is the rate of velocity in kilometers per second. And it turns out when you do a joint fit, or when we did a joint fit, between these, uh, with this different rate of velocity curve, with infrared RV measurements, uh, we get this result, and we actually move these stars around on this diagram significantly. And so this superinflated star is now <coughs> plopped right on. Uh, there's, there's no prior. We did a Bayesian analysis, but we didn't put any prior on it to force it here. It just plopped right on that line, and this primary star got moved up quite a bit in mass. Um, and so we sort of got rid of that one. Now, Yunqiu's code uh, is, is uh, very easy to use, and a senior undergraduate at BU went ahead and took, to, took a look at some of these other stars. <laughs> Said, you know, that one's not real, what about these? And uh, these stars are actually HAT, uh, discovered in the HAT data, and that data is also public. And we were able to acquire a few radio velocity measurements, not as many as Yunqiu did for this one particular star, but uh, this is Brian Healy, who's now a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. And his senior thesis, which he passed and received honors in the major for, showed that these are also um, on this mass radius line. Now, we don't have a lot of RV measurements, and so this isn't accepted into the literature yet, but that's our goal. Uh, so what's happened is um, we now believe many eclipsing binaries have, for lack of a better term, inaccurate radii. Uh, I don't want to lob grenades around but I don't know what else to do. <laughs> um, so what do we do now? We have all these other ones here too, right? All these stars, which are sort of oddly large. So what we're doing, or rather um, uh, my PhD student yin -Q is doing, instead of revising each of those stars, I mean, that's not really a fun, is that really a fun science experiment? Go revise the literature for six years, and make a bunch of enemies, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> Uh, instead, what we're doing is, is we're going to try to produce a, we're calling it a pristine mass radius <laughs> where the only, I'll get to your question, where the only data we use are Kepler 
is Kepler photometry, so no ground-based data, uh, not noisy ground-based data, all, it's all precise, beautiful photometry, and all of our radial velocities are in the infrared, where we get these really high-precision SV2 uh, radial velocities from both stars. And so we don't know what that will produce, but we're anticipating we're going to clean this up. And with those dozen or so stars, we're anticipating a very nice, clean mass radius relationship. There's a question, yeah? Are you going to find, uh, go remeasure a star right on the main sequence there to see how much it moves to? Right, so that's the question we often get. Yeah. It's like you can't just go after, if you want to do this, yeah, right, don't you just, just go after, after the anomalies. You have to go after the normal ones. Yeah. And the problem is that's just such a huge endeavor. These are dozens and dozens of objects. And so we actually thought about that, and in Yinku's oral examination, which is passed, um, we had a question that we had that exact question. Are you going to go back? You can't just do the anomalous ones. And so we're, we're kind of getting around that by saying, let's just forget the entire literature. And let's pick the best objects we can measure and get precise measurements where we, uh, we understand the noise properties, we understand the uncertainties, and see what we get. That, that's a very good question. OK, uh, so that's what we're anticipating, but we'll see. So um, the other thing I want to talk about, and I'm going much too slow here, is uh, this issue here, where you have this large change in radius with temperature. And I said I'd start talking about exoplanets, so this is the exoplanet part. So we'll get to some exciting exoplanets. Uh, so we have this big change here. And uh, the question is, what's causing that? Um, and as I said earlier, uh, we think it's metallicity. We think metallicity is the reason you have many different radii at a given effective temperature. Something's got to give. Something's got to be different about the star. And this is the obvious next parameter. And evolutionary models suggest so. So if you go to some state-of-the-art stellar evolutionary models, and we're using the Dartmouth evolutionary models, um, which uh, were started by Brian Chauvier at Dartmouth, and he's had students, PhD students, graduate and update them and change them. Uh, you see, if you go and download just tons of stars from the models, so I haven't actually run an evolutionary code, I've just downloaded stars that have been run you see a lot of interesting things. So here we have, again, our hertzborn russell like diagram. Radius of the star versus temperature. These are sun-like stars, and some of them are evolving off. Again, this is not, there's no uh, IMF in here. These are just stars from the database. There's no initial mass function. This is not a cluster. This is just stars of different metallicities. Hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of stars downloaded from this model. And here we have the M dwarfs, or the red dwarfs. Um, and you can already see this metallicity dependence. So at a fixed temperature, you have a wide range of radii for different metallicities. And notice these metallicities, the differences are not that extreme. So those of you who do globular clusters or population two stars, you might have metallicities that are much less than minus 0.1. These are this, this is just solar neighborhood different metallicities. And you see this dramatic difference. What this says is, if you can measure an M-dwarf's temperature, and its metallicity, you can walk over here and read off the radius. That's what it says. If you trust these models, you have to trust the models. Uh, it turns out measuring metallicities of M dwarfs is extremely challenging, as people here know. It's very challenging. Here is a figure made by another student of mine, Mark Bayette, showing a little snippet of uh, B-band spectra, high resolution spectra for a sun-like star here. Down at the bottom, you have a sort of continuum-like thing with a bunch of lines. The continuum is mostly due to H minus opacity, which is flat, flat opacity. So if you didn't have any other molecules, you just have a nice flat black body. Uh, you have these iron lines indicated. And you can go measure the depth of that iron line, compare it to a model, say how much iron is in that star. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. That work is very hard. Measuring metallicities of sun-like stars is its own universe of challenges. But it is infinitely more challenging when this is your spectrum. And this is not noise. This looks like a noisy spectrum. That's not noise. This is a stellar model. <laughs> these are transitions from molecules. All right, Molecules have all these zillions of waves of, ch of change. They can rotate. They can vibrate. They can rotate and vibrate. They can have an electronic transition modified by rotation and vibration. And so you get this mess. Oh, and does anybody see that iron line? <laughs> this neutral iron. This is neutral iron. Neutral iron should be in both of these atmospheres. All right. This is cool, but I mean, this is hot, but it still has neutral iron. It's still neutral iron, so it should be the same exact same absorption line in, in 
you have to somehow measure that. That's impossible. So um, instead of the traditional methods that have been used, uh, the, the techniques now are only recently developed actually for measuring network metallicities, and I know Jen has some that she's developed too uh, in her group. Uh, but the, the sort of state of the art is to use deep lines in the infrared. And uh, my colleague, actually my office mate at Cornell developed this technique. Her name is uh, Barbara Rosayella. She's now a professor in Santiago at Andres Bello University. She developed a technique to uh, measure the equivalent widths of a sodium doublet and calcium triplet in the infrared, where the lines are very deep with respect to this pseudo continuum. So again, this is a noise. Those are molecules. But all those molecules, all those transitions are fighting each other. So you get something that's kind of, kind of like a H minus continuum, maybe, you know, kind of like a continuum. The point is you can measure the depths of these lines with respect to that. And she did this for M dwarfs that had sun-like star companions where the metallicity was known, and she was able to calibrate a method to measure metallicity of those M dwarfs using sodium and calcium lines. Now it's important to note that you're you're tracing, you're measuring the you're trying to get the iron abundance, but you're not using iron, you're using sodium and calcium. So there is a relationship there. It's like using CO to trace hydrogen if you're a radio astronomer. There's a relationship, but you're not directly measuring the hydrogen when you measure CO, right? Uh, and it just exists in these, it, it, it exists because we know the metallicity of the sunlight companion. Now, uh, a student in my group, Mark Bayette, has a paper from 2016 where he where we think we explain why that correlation exists, it's not simply because the sodium goes up with the iron, it's actually more complicated, and it has to do with the C to O ratio of the star. And in our paper, um, Physical Mechanisms Behind End Work Metallicity Indicators, we claim, or we, we, we show in models, that um, the C to O ratio of the star is actually affecting this continuum and changing the effective equivalent width. And that's what you're actually measuring. But it still works. We're not saying it doesn't work. In our paper, we're not saying this, this doesn't work to measure iron. It's just that you're not really measuring iron, you're measuring C to O, which follows iron because of the star formation history of the universe. Is the CO part of pseudo continuum? So you're measuring the iron relative to pseudo continuum? Close, it's, it's close. So the pseudo continuum is actually H2O. But the C to O ratio regulates how much O can go in H2O because your CO ratio is always less than one. So if you increase the CO ratio, you take oxygen out of hydrogen of, of water, of H2O, and that changes the continuum. So it's close, but it's, it's slightly more complicated. So anyway, we set out to do this, and we set out to actually measure the temperatures and the metallicities for all of the M dwarfs that Kepler's found planets around. So that's the bottom here. These are all the transiting planets that the primary mission, primary Kepler mission found. Um, and we set out to measure the properties of these stars way down here, which were largely uncertain because of this issue with temperature. By the way, these don't have parallaxes. These don't have luminosities, so Gaia is going to really help. This is pre-Gaia, pre still pre-Gaia until, I guess, six weeks from now, it'll be pre-Gaia. Uh, so we set out to measure those pre-Gaia. This is a paper series called Characterizing the Cool KOIs. Um, uh, there are about 3,000 end dwarfs observed by the primary Kepler mission. 100 showed transit signals. And so we went to follow them up, measure these properties. And it's produced a paper series where we've identified specific objects that are especially interesting. We've published catalogs, um, and uh, happy to talk about this uh, more uh, in, uh, in meetings later. But I'm going to focus on just a couple of, re of results. For this project, we used an instrument that I worked on for my PhD thesis at Cornell. This is the triple spec infrared spectrograph. Um, it uh, gives you JH, actually also Y band, Y, J, H, and K band in a single shot for a single object. And it's, uh, it's still residing, actually, at the uh, Palomar 200 inch telescope in Southern California. And uh, this is me <laughs> working on it a long time ago. So we took the spectrograph and we measured temperature. We measured metallicity using Barbara Hossayella's techniques. We plugged those into these models for stars uh, that were produced by the Dartmouth group. And then we read off the radii. And so here we have triangles indicating all these are all planet hosting M dwarfs. 
Um, they've been colored by the metallicity, and these are the evolutionary tracks. This one is weird. We'll get to that in a minute. This one was measured a different way. Uh, so here we are. We have all of these radii. Now, the radii from the Kepler catalog were highly uncertain. Many of these objects were just given radii of one solar radius because they didn't know what, what else to ascribe them based on the photometry, which is fine. I'm actually working on the catalog for tests, and it's the same problem. It's very hard to estimate these radii, so there's no, I mean, no uh, animosity towards the Kepler team, but they did not have these radii. And so then we can go take these transiting planets and do exactly what we've talked about. So now we know this is a 2 or 0.2 solar radius star. What's the size of the planet? And this is where we found some really awesome stuff. So the smallest one here is Kepler 42. Uh, this is a few years old now. But uh, this is a mid-type M dwarf, an M4 dwarf, uh, with about a little less than a 0.2 solar radius, uh, radius. And it has three transit signals of very small planets, all orbiting with periods of less than three days. Very compact system. And so when we identified the size of the star, revised the size of the planets, we realized that they were all smaller than Earth. And we told NASA, and they, whenever you have something new, they get really excited and make you cool artwork. <laughs> so they made this cool artwork for us. Uh, here we have images of uh, illustrating another Kepler planet, Earth, another Kepler planet, Mars, and then these three planets, really tiny planets. Again, the only reason we know their size is because we know the size of the star. At the time, these were the smallest exoplanets um, ever found around a hydrogen burning star. The pulsar planets are believed to be much smaller. Those are moon-sized exoplanets. But around hydrogen burning stars, these are the smallest. And so they made us this really pretty image. This was my title slide showing the M dwarf star with its three little planets. Now, of course, we have no idea what their surfaces are like, so they picked some high entropy color here, because we don't really know. Maximum entropy on these. No idea, so they, they kind of shaded a little bit. But that was pretty exciting. Um, later, we identified, this is, a, this is a survey they took several years to actually get all these spectra. These are relatively faint objects, so it took a long time to gather all these spectra. Uh, we also found a couple other cool systems that are similar. So since then, we found two more M dwarfs that are small, 0.2 solar radii, that have these compact multiple systems, many, many planets orbiting within only a few days. And uh, here they are, actually illustrated, the, the, the stars are illustrated with respect to Jupiter and the Galilean moons. So here's Jupiter with the four Galilean moons. And these distances are the, uh, you know, the center major axes. Of course, you never get them all to line up like this. You have to wait like a million years for them to line up like that. So they don't ever look like this, but just an illustration. Here's Kepler 42, a little bit bigger than Jupiter, believe it or not, with its with its three planets orbiting with le periods of less than three days. And then here are the other the two new ones, Kepler 445 and 446. These are a little bit bigger. The planets are a little bit bigger. C here is probably atmosphere dominated, but now that we have three compact multiple systems orbiting M dwarfs, as soon as you have three of something, what can you do? Statistics. Statistics. That's right. Bad. An error of the square root of three. That's your error. And that's exactly what we did. So we said we said we have three compact multiples orbiting mid M dwarf stars. How common are they? Right? So that to do that, oh actually I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going to skip ahead because of time. Um, to do that, you have to figure out how many mid M dwarf stars could we have detected these planets around. And so for that, you have to estimate the sizes of not just the planet hosts, but also the non-planet hosts. And that's a big uncertainty because we don't have spectra for the 3,000 M dwarfs. So instead, we had to use colors. And colors are uncertain. But it's statistics, so hopefully it's all washed. And so how many of these could we find? And how many of these could we find? And how many of these could we find if they were there? And on the numerator, you have how many you did find. Uh, one of these, and one of these, and one of these. And what we get is one in five, 21%, one in five mid M dwarf stars have compact multiple systems. And you'll notice the error is um, Poisson. It's asymmetric, just like Poisson distributions, and it's about the square root of three. Uh, the signal to noise is the square root of three. But the point is now go pick a mid M dwarf star, Barnard star, Proxima Centauri, which we know has at least one planet, we think has one planet. Um, T. Garvin star, Captain star, Wolf 359 for the Star Trek fans, 
Uh, these are all MedM dwarfs. One in five of those probably have these really compact systems, so that's pretty cool. We also showed that there appear to be more compact systems, again, here's your Poisson error, but there appear to be more compact systems orbiting mid-M dwarfs than early M dwarfs or sun-like stars, where here we had to, again, rely on catalogs. We didn't take these spectra, so we had to rely on catalogs. Now, I don't know if you believe this is significant or not. I think it is. Um, any two of these together is not. Just this and just this is not significant. But all three together gives you some trend. And so we actually think, this is suggesting that even smaller stars, late M dwarfs and brown dwarfs, may be, have many of these compact multiple systems. They may all be like the Galilean moons. Brown dwarfs may all have Galilean moon structures around them, or planets. I don't even know what you call them at that point. So that's pretty cool. Um, now I'll just talk really quickly about this one, and then I'll wrap up, because it looks like I'm at my 45 minutes here. So this one, why is this off this grid? Because we use the stellar evolutionary models to get the radii, so this should be within the model prediction, so it's not. The reason is that this is actually an eclipsing binary that we discovered, um, and this is an M dwarf that has a white dwarf eclipsing it. And it's kind of a cool system. We actually got a little press release on this, too, which I won't, for the sake of time, I'll get into. But uh, it turns out the white dwarf, as it goes in front of the M dwarf, it lenses via gravitational lensing some of the M dwarf light. So we were getting tripped about the size of the white dwarf, because when it transited, it was, wasn't as deep as it should be. That's because of lensing. So they, they did a little press thing for us, and they said, Kepler proves Einstein is right, which is sort of funny, because Kepler is like four centuries before Einstein. <laughs> they got kind of kicked out of that. But um, this one, they're in a very short orbit, this M dwarf and this white dwarf. It's a 1.8 day binary orbit. The tidal forces are absurd. I mean, a white dwarf has incredible tidal forces because it's a massive sun in such, such a small area, so this small volume. And so we could measure, we empirically measured the radii of this star independent of models because it's eclipsing. But it's off this grid. So this actually hints that rotation magnetic fields still may play a role in the radii of these stars. All right? Or at least in the discrepancy between the star and the model. Maybe not in the true, you know, I, I, we, we don't really, all we can say is that it's different than the model. And so this is actually the next big challenge. We don't think they're causing the super crazy inflated up north. We think those are all just mistakes. But we think it actually probably is causing some discrepancy. Okay, so I have some stuff here on another project, but I've used up so much of your time, I'm just going to skip ahead here. Dan's seen this because I presented at AAS, and he, he doesn't believe it, so I can, <laughs> I can skip ahead. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, just want to say some concluding remarks and have two more slides of just fun images. So the point here is that to know thy small, or this is supposed to be thy, to know thy small planet, you must know thy small star. So you have to know the size of the star to make any physical statements about the planet. It's not calculus, it's just geometry. But measuring the size of that star is not straightforward. It's actually quite complicated. You need, if you don't have a parallax, you need both temperature and metallicity. So you have to have a way to measure the metallicity. That is hard. Okay, that's actually quite challenging because the spectra is so complicated. And in the case of the size versus mass in those odd objects sitting above that nice line, we think that's actually inaccurate the, uh, fitting of the eclipsing binary. And so we're working to show this with the, this pristine sample of Kepler objects. The last topic I didn't get to, that's about alpha enhancement, but maybe I can talk about it in meetings later. I want to get everybody excited about two things, and I'll stop and take questions. The first is the launch of tests. So Kepler was enormously successful. It was a Discovery class mission. So Discovery class missions are funded at the 800 million or so level. Uh, huge mission to find new transiting planets around stars to understand their statistics. TESS is an explorer class mission, so it's smaller, 250 million or so. Uh, but this is being billed as the next Kepler, because unlike Kepler, it's going to search for transiting planets around nearby stars. And uh, I've been working with, also, I've been working with an NM uh, PhD named Ryan Olkers on determining the best M dwarf stars in the solar neighborhood for TESS to observe, and we have a nice catalog. We don't, unfortunately, have the Gaia data. They won't give it to us, but we have a catalog knowing everything we do. Uh, we have everything we know about these stars. And it's actually launching in March, which is really scary, but exciting. 
And uh, so far, there hasn't been a delay. So this one, this one may actually happen. I just put in my request for the bash. We'll see if I get it. And then the other thing is uh, cool stars. So for all of you here who study stars or M-dwarfs or um, any, any star that has an atmosphere that's cool, even giant stars, we're having a huge meeting at Boston University this summer. It's the 20th uh, meeting of the Cambridge Workshop on Cool Stars, Stellar Systems, and the Sun. Uh, this is a really fun meeting. Usually have 400 to 500 people talking about the latest work on cool stars. It's not specifically planet related. It's really focused on the stars, but we will have planet talks. We just had our deadline for the splinter sessions, and I know at least one was proposed for eclipsing binaries, but the abstract deadline will be uh, probably in March. So please consider coming. Uh, Boston's a really fun city in the summer. It's not cold. <laughs> and we're right on the river, right on the Charles River here. We're really close to Fenway. Uh, the Yankees are in town. So if you want to see that rivalry, this is where it will be held in the George Sherman Union at BU. And our, it's almost, un, it's almost inked on, in the contract, but the banquet right now is scheduled for top of the hub, which is the top of the Prudential Tower. People who've been to Boston know where this is. And we're going to try to get telescopes there, not to look at stars, <laughs> but to watch the Yankees do it, play the Red Sox. <laughs> we should have a line site right at the home plate. We might point some at stars, too. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'll take any questions you have. Technically, what you're measuring is an angular size of the star. And you can combine that with the flux to get a truly empirical measurement of the effective temperature. Effective temperature being defined as 4 pi r squared t to the fourth equals the luminosity. You have r, you have l, you have a real measurement of that effective temperature. But the whole thing can parallax? Yeah, you have to have parallaxes. Those stars all have the interferometric ones all have parallaxes because they're nearby. You can only do this on the brightest stars. But for the other ones, now you start playing games. Because to get to that, to get to that true definition of effective temperature, you need to know the volumetric luminosity. So the luminosity in all bands, much of that energy coming out in the mid-infrared, right? And you need to know uh, the um, you need to know volumetric luminosity and the radius, a truly empirical measurement of the radius which is the thing we don't have, it's the thing we want. So your question is really good, it's really poignant because we are using other techniques to get that effective temperature. We're using indices on the spectrum in our case. So uh, something else that Barbara did in her thesis research, which, which we've used, is calibrate, oh boy, sorry, it's gonna take a while, is calibrate a way to go from the, um, bend in the pseudo continuum across K band, calibrate that to effective temperature as best as you can. So it's not empirical. It's, it involves a little bit of modeling, it involves a little bit of empirical work, but it's, it's, it's just the best temperature we can get based on the shape of the spectrum. We could be using this spectrum. Oh, right. So, well, we're claiming uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 Kelvin. People are really skeptical of that, uh, but that's that's what we're claiming. Yeah. I would say you had a nice different RP curve. Mm -hmm. Analysis. It seems unlikely that somebody would uh, so those measurements are the problem. So that, that and I bet they were in the optical. So how do you get a different degree of velocity curve? Yeah, so it's, yeah, I'll answer your question. So it's, it's a little complicated. The first team used H alpha in emission from the two stars, which is just not a good idea. But that was, it's, I don't really blame them too much because um, that group had access to a one meter telescope in uh, uh, the middle of Turkey and they just had a low resolution spectrograph and they did the best they could given that spectrograph. And it's actually, it's actually pretty cool what they did given given what they had. 
but they used the emission lines and they saw the emission lines start to separate and come back. But of course, the shape of the emission line is complicated. It contains the chromosphere, which is patchy. And um, so I think that's what led them to get their, uh, these, these data points down here that are in gray. Now, this other group, Iglesias Marzoa um, and Mercedes Lopez Morales, who's also who was his advisor, went back and reanalyzed the Kepler data with a more complicated technique. They acquired their own radio velocity measurements in the optical, not using H alpha, but just using optical high resolution spectra, but they couldn't pull out the secondary. So they only had SB1 measurements, and they trusted the other group's SB2 measurements. Does that make sense? This is why you have to go to the infrared. The problem is that for M dwarf stars, 3500 Kelvin, in the optical, you're on the beam side of the black body. So a really tiny difference in temperature, if the secondary is 3000 Kelvin and the primary is 3500 Kelvin, is a huge difference in the flux in the optical because you're on the beam side. It's exponential. And so if you try to do RVs and optical on the beam side of stars, you're only going to see the radio velocity from the brighter one, the primary. But if you go to the infrared and you have access to this amazing spectrograph, which we were very lucky to, to have, um, they're on the Rayleigh gene side, and so now it's no longer as severe. It only goes as T, not the X part. It's a long answer to your question, but there is an answer. So the differences are greatest, however, on the um, uh, this is the secondary. Secondary moves more. All the secondary Yeah. No, I always I make the same mistake all the time. Yeah. yeah. The Kepler lab curve you showed. Mm -hmm. show that again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so here, uh, I'm wondering the residues here. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, you say the, the residue here is on the left hand side, it's fair, it is very long. Fair. That's right, and it's also different during eclipse than out of eclipse. And so what we think is happening is there are spot crossing events going on. Now, this is where the nuts and bolts of eclipsing binary fitting, this is where people get very partisan, so to speak. And there are eclipsing binary fitting codes that will include spots and spot crossing. You know, they'll actually add spots to the star and add crossing events for each, each individual eclipse, the model, you can model some spot structure, right? And um, if you do that, you, you can do that. We did it. And the reason is, and from our perspective, and also a Bayesian perspective, as soon as you start adding things with so many possibilities, you know, you can put the spots anywhere on the star, you're increasing the number of model parameters. And in a Bayesian formulation, that penalizes the model. I could get these residuals down to zero if I start putting random spots on and I allow them to be different sizes and different numbers and different locations and differential rotation, and you know, you're adding each one as another dimension in the fit, not just another parameter. It's another, it's you know, a, a whole other dimension. So three dimensions, four dimensions, and now you're up to twenty dimensional likelihood function you're trying to figure out. It's very hard. So our attitude was no. The spot crossings should even out. They should, just, they should just wash out. And so we didn't model them, we left them as residuals. And that was our attitude, and our result is they line up on the mass radius line, and I think that's the right way to go. But one of the things we might do at Cool Stars, it's been proposed, is an EB fitting challenge. Right? They've done this for interferometry imaging, they've done this for some other things where you have some data and you try to fit. Um, See who gets the right answer. It's complicated though, because who who produces the data? You know? <laughs> so we might we might have a competition to see who's who's actually getting the right answer. But we're confident. We're really confident because we've got this beads on a string here. Yes, the residuals are higher. We think that's spot crossing. It's really not actually in this. We think that the real difference in our parameters is in the radial velocities, as you can see. Although it is combined with the photometry, and we line up on the mass radius diagram. So we just have a lot of things pushing us towards that this is the right answer. Does that answer your question? Probably more thoroughly than you wanted. Yeah. All right, well, Phil will be around all the rest of today. We're going to take him to lunch and dinner tonight. And there will be grand rest this afternoon. Let's thank him again. Thank you.